On the evening of December 10th, 2021, a worrying combination of atmospheric conditions would lead to a devastating outbreak of tornadoes across the Mississippi and Ohio River valleys. Its consequences would shake the region to its core and leave everything in its path unrecognizable. One of the tornadoes in this outbreak would be particularly devastating, leaving untold devastation, injuring hundreds and claiming the lives of 57, an unseen monster masked by the darkness of night. Today, we discuss the Mayfield Tornado. The morning of December 10th seemed no more exceptional than the days prior aside from some unusually warm and pleasant weather for what was supposed to be winter. Many residents were carrying on with their daily activities, preparing for the upcoming holidays. However, unseen to the average person, the building blocks of a major disaster are assembling above their heads. A deep, upper-level trough is moving in from the west. As it crosses the Rocky Mountains, a surface low develops and starts to drift northeast. As it does so, unseasonably warm and moist air is being drawn in from the Gulf of Mexico. Dew points across the warm sector soar into the mid to upper 60s with temperatures breaking records for December. This contributes to Cape values of 1,500 to 2,000 joules per kilogram. Winds in the warm sector change rapidly in both intensity and direction with altitude, leading to a strongly sheared environment. The intense wind shear and ample instability are forming an environment favorable for the formation of long-track, intense, rotating thunderstorms called supercells. These storms can produce torrential rainfall, severe winds, hail, and most concerning of all, intense tornadoes. Noting the risk for severe weather, the Storm Prediction Center denotes a level 4 out of 5 moderate risk for the area, including the risk for strong nocturnal tornadoes. The environment is primed. All that is needed is a trigger. Storms would initiate in northeastern Arkansas and slowly organize as they drifted northeast. One of these cells would organize into a powerful supercell and around 7 p.m. produced its first tornadoes. Locals and storm chasers would observe several brief weak tornadoes, including two on the ground simultaneously as the storm approached the south side of Jonesboro, Arkansas. Racing off to the northeast of Jonesboro, the supercell would produce its fifth and first violent tornado. The tornado would cause its first damage at 7.07 p.m. Central Standard Time, inflicting minor EF0 to EF1 damage early on before quickly intensifying to EF2 strength. The tornado then intensified to EF3 strength as it struck the city of Monette, causing severe damage, injuring many, and claiming its first life as the storm impacted the Monette Manor nursing home, causing significant damage to the structure. The tornado would continue to cause severe damage as it impacted the town of Leechville, Arkansas, and claimed another life as it destroyed a Dollar General. The tornado fluctuated in intensity as it crossed into Missouri before abruptly becoming violent as it approached the town of Haytai, causing EF4 damage and claiming two more victims, one of which was tragically a nine-year-old girl. The tornado would again become violent after crossing the Mississippi River into Tennessee, impacting the town of Tiptonville, where three more would perish. The tornado would claim its final victim as it impacted the town of Sandburg before finally dissipating at 8.36 p.m. Central Standard Time after traveling for more than 80 miles and claiming eight lives. This tornado, with estimated peak winds of 170 miles per hour, received an EF4 rating. Following this EF4, the storm began to cycle as it approached the Kentucky border. The tornado would inflict its first damage near the Woodland Mills area before racing off to the northeast and rapidly intensifying as it crossed the border into Kentucky. On approach to Casey, Kentucky, the tornado became violent, sweeping many structures off their foundations and badly damaging the fire department. The tornado claimed one life and injured several others before exiting Casey. Damage here would peak at low-end EF4 intensity. 
The tornado continued its track to the northeast, carving in deep scour marks and trenches into the ground, indicating it was still extremely violent. The tornado continued to inflict significant damage as it drew closer and closer to the city of Mayfield, Kentucky, a city of more than 10,000 people. The debris ball is now coming into Mayfield. Um, it, send some prayers to Mayfield right now. Uh, let's 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 keep our friends in prayer. The tornado the roared into the southwestern fringes of Mayfield around 9:25 p.m. at EF4 intensity, obliterating several well-built structures, sweeping their foundations clean of debris, and shredding a candle factory to the ground with more than 100 workers inside, resulting in eight deaths and numerous injuries. With it now clear that a violent tornado would hit the heart of Mayfield, the National Weather Service issued a tornado emergency at 9:26 p.m. Mayfield was swallowed by the ferocious winds of the tornado. The twister directly impacted the downtown area, destroying several well-built multi-story buildings as it carved its way through the center of the city. Businesses and residences alike were swept away into the deadly vortex as debris was lofted to more than 30,000 feet into the air. 22 would perish before the tornado's wrath had finished with the city. Inflicting high-end EF4 damage, the tornado exited Mayfield and drew its sights on the city of Benton, where another tornado emergency would be issued. spare Benton, passing just to the north of town. However, in doing so, the tornado closed in on the small community of Cambridge Shores. The tornado would slam into the lakeside community at 9.57 p.m., sweeping away many homes and inflicting EF4 damage before crossing into the land between the lake's recreation area and leaving a trail of deforestation in its wake. After crossing the lakes, the tornado began to close the distance to the town of Princeton, prompting another tornado emergency to be issued. The tornado would impact the south side of Princeton at 10.17 p.m., devastating the Golf and Country Club community where many homes were destroyed, with some being completely swept to their foundations. The tornado would reach EF4 intensity here and claim four more lives before exiting the town, carving deep cycloidal marks into the earth. The tornado then approached the town of Dawson Springs, again prompting yet another tornado emergency as the mile-wide wedge roared into the town. At 10.32 p.m., the tornado made a direct hit on the residential side of town at EF4 intensity flattening entire neighborhoods and shredding buildings down to their foundations. An apartment building here would be dismantled down to just a few interior walls on the lowest level, and several industrial buildings would be seriously damaged. A photograph from one of the homes in Dawson Springs would be lofted by the wrath of the twister and was later found more than 120 miles away in Indiana. Fourteen would tragically perish here before the monstrous winds of the tempest moved on. The tornado continued on its track, impacting a few other small communities to the northeast of Dawson Springs at EF3 intensity, flattening or completely sweeping away many poorly built structures while rapidly closing in on the small community of Bremen, where the National Weather Service had issued another tornado emergency. Towards the north side of Bremen, it suddenly intensified to near EF5 strength, obliterating several well-built structures and sleeping their slabs completely clean of debris. Trees sustained severe debarking and denutting, 
the ground was scoured. Several vehicles were thrown and the debris from slabbed homes were windrowed through the farmland by the violent winds. Footage of the monster tornado was captured by Eddie Knight as it passed just to his south. Continuing through Bremen, the tornado would sweep away several more homes, scouring the foundation and driveway. Several poorly constructed residents and manufactured homes would be completely destroyed and swept away as the tornado finally left Bremen, taking 11 more lives with it. The tornado weakened after leaving Bremen and would continue at EF3 intensity, impacting a few other small communities as it tracked to the northeast. Supercell began to cross into less favorable conditions as storm coverage increased and its inflow was interfered with. Tracking for roughly another 40 miles through a mostly rural area, the tornado began to gradually weaken before finally dissipating at 11.48 p.m. near the Rough River Dam State Park. By the time the sun had risen on December 11th, thousands had been injured and 95 had lost their lives. The Western Kentucky tornado made up a vast majority of the casualties at 57 and had traveled for more than 165 miles in roughly 3 hours, leaving catastrophic damage in its wake. The daylight would reveal town after town after town had suffered devastating losses, and one evening an invisible horror had changed the history of this region forever. After surveying the damage caused by the Western Kentucky tornado, it was determined that the twister had peak winds of 190 miles per hour, earning it an EF4 rating. The poor construction quality of many of the homes in this region and the fact the tornado occurred after dark certainly contributed to the tragically high death toll, becoming the single deadliest tornado since the Joplin EF5 10 years earlier. Perhaps the most haunting aspect of this tragedy was the fact that many of the people in the path of the storm were well warned and were fully aware of the disaster that was roaring towards them. However, many had nowhere else to go and were forced to ride out a violent tornado in their homes. I can't begin to imagine the horror of knowing such a calamity is racing towards you and you have nowhere to hide. When a town is hit by a violent tornado, it's never the same again, but time can help heal the wounds. Six months later, I would revisit the track of this historic tornado to find that nature had already begun to undo the damage brought by the twister. To my surprise, some of the homes in some of the hardest hit areas have already been rebuilt. However, most of the impacted areas are still reeling from the destruction and are going to need help with the recovery efforts for years to come. The path to recovery is going to be slow and many of the scars of that night will never fully heal. But with time and hard work, these communities can bounce back from that tragic night in December.